I would say that learning the difference between confidence and cockiness. Okay. I think that was like the thing that took a while. Today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out EnigmaElements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, Elements.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Mike Petchy, man. How are you doing, brother? I am doing great and very happy to be here, my man. Thank you, man. I thank you. I, I wanted to have you on the show because uh, you have a very unique uh, story and uh, journey in filmmaking. And uh, and I love your aesthetic of the films that you've done and your style in general. And I just, I thought it'd be a nice, a nice treat for the tribe. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I can uh, give you guys some stuff that you learned from. All right, cool, yeah. man. How did you get you into know? business in the first place, brother? How did I get in? So at first, the short, the abbreviated version of the long story is that I grew up wanting to be a comic book artist. Mm -hmm. And so I would, as a kid, read books and do sketches and do all that work. But I was a real crappy student. Um, and so when I got out of uh, high school, I didn't get into art school. And my parents, like, they wanted to, like, throw me out. <laughs> they were so upset with me. Um, and in the, I had a part-time job where I was working as a manager in a music store. And I really loved introducing people to new music. I really loved uh, the ex the shared experience of listening to music. High fidelity. I, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Very similar. It was at that time period. Um, so uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do radio because I had really good, great connections being in a music store. I knew a lot of like um, A&R dudes from labels and that kind of stuff. And so I went to community college for, for radio. And my first show I had, it was like late, late. It was like 2.30 a.m. And my first show, uh, the program director sort of walked in and he goes, okay, so every 15 minutes uh, at the top of the hour, you can play the CDs with the red sticker. And at the bottom of the hour, you can play the CDs with the green sticker. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, like, why am I here? And, and luckily I made that call because <laughs> I was right around the time that MP3s were starting and, and music was becoming digital. Uh, and I'm like, I don't really see a career in this. Uh, and I happened to be just sort of taking a court, like a credit filler course, which was a filmmaking course, like a very sort of rudimentary theory course. And I had loved movies as a kid and I used to make home videos, but I never really thought about, you know, you sit down, you watch Indiana Jones and I never thought at that time period, how did they make Indiana Jones? I didn't even think that there were people that were involved with making it. I just would watch it and I knew Indy wasn't in this box in my, my room, but I was just so captivated with it that i didn't care <laughs> and this was pre-youtube pre behind the scenes pre any of that stuff um and so i remember i went to the film course and i think we watched uh, citizen kane of course and we of watched course. blade and we watched blade runner mm -hmm. and uh i had my my mind blown open because i hadn't seen blade runner before <laughs> and uh i remember the the professor was like so what did you think of the wardrobe and i was like whoa wait a minute there's someone that oh my god there's someone that does that and there's someone that does it so it was like sort of like taking the, the red pill or the blue pill in the matrix and you're just like, you're like oh my god and uh looking at it i was like look it, it takes everything that i love about comic book work so compositions and, and working within a frame and creating depth out of a 2d image um and everything i like about music and sort of that sort of communal thing and then as a young kid i worked as an airplane mechanic i was uh a house painter and a, and a construction guy and that whole crew mentality uh is a big part of it too so it, it sort of took all the elements that i loved um and and made a one thing and so i went to i was going to a small community school and i went and i talked to my guidance counselor and i was like hey so uh i want to do movies and he's like cool all right and and i'm like cool so when do i get to pick up a camera he's like well you got to take these required courses for accreditation and I'm like, why, they, why am I taking – why am I doing this? I'm like, how much do each one of these classes cost? And he gave me the price. And I'm like, I'll see you later. And I left. 
uh, and I went to work for a public access TV station for a year. Mm-hmm. And in that time period, this was this was probably ninety nine, two thousand ish. In that time period, most of the film schools were like, "Hey, you sign up for a four year course, uh-huh. you pay the you pay the same amount as the other guy, and maybe you're holding a boom." And I just didn't want to be that deep in debt. And this is right around the time where New York Film Academy was starting. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had like a four or five month course. And I was like, let me do it. And uh, I saved up, went out, did that in New York City, a city that I had never lived in. I learned to produce and shot three short films and then came home and started my own business. So, wow, man. That Well, first of all, I want everyone listening how smart it was. Like, I don't want to get into debt. So yeah. many filmmakers just they look, this is the way I have to go. And they there's like it may be in nineteen sixty five, but not now. Uh, you Dude. know <laughs> they, Dude, it's a- they walk out they walk out with like what eighty thousand in debt? You're not gonna like and, and what what year? How many years do you have to be in the business if you're lucky to generate eighty thousand dollars? Exactly. <laughs> this is what this is what I talk about on my podcast all the time. It's like it it takes you eight years before anybody gives a shit about you. Mm-hmm. So it's Eight years of you doing uh, practice, research, um, technique uh, building, and then uh, going out and, and PAing. Like, expect not to get paid for at least two years. You right. know, and you go and you work for free, you work on these jobs. And it's the unfortunate part about this business is that they expect that. So that's part of what you have to do. And so uh, to have that kind of debt, you. The only way you can survive starting, even now, not even starting out, I've been doing this for 18 years and I still can only survive this way. You have to keep your overhead way down, mm-hmm. way down. And I think it's a, I don't, I don't want to go too far off on it, but I think it's a crime. I, I, I live in Boston right now and Boston has 126 colleges and I just feel like it's a bunch of vultures just waiting. Mm-hmm. And, and when you come out of school, they want you indebted to them that's straight up so like you have this massive student loan behind you and i don't care what industry you're in right now unless you have to go to a school that requires intensive training like biology chemistry like medical all that kind of stuff i get it because there's a you can't fail or practice on a patient you 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 have to like go through that process well they actually do practice on us that's why it's called a medical practice but that's a whole other conversation for another day (laughs) well you know you know what i'm saying i know i know what you mean Our business, I see our business being very similar to like a a trade. So I think our business is an apprenticeship business. I think you learn more doing uh, uh, assisting work and apprenticeship work. And if you're, if you're smart about it, um, you get right into that and you figure out what position you like, you figure out where you land in the filmmaking world and how it makes you happy or not. Because a lot of folks, everybody starts out and they go, I want to be a director. Everybody Mm. starts out that way. Yeah, right. Or they want to be a DP or they want to do that. And in theory, whenever I was in school or classes or I'm reading books about it, they're so dry and they're usually being taught to you by someone that doesn't do it. And right. so they're like, here's technically how it's supposed to work. And then if you go and you do this and, and then when you're physically on the job, you realize that most of what a DP does, half of what he does is like image control and maintaining that. But most of what he's doing is managerial he's a father figure he's uh dealing uh he's he's in a relationship with the director um and then uh he's also dealing with money and producers and that is if you're not wired that way that'll kill you if you think you're just going to go in and like sit by the camera all day and like tweak things and push buttons and stuff, that's no. not your thing that's not that's not what that job is and if if you read about that in a textbook that's what they tell you that job is mm-hmm. so I don't know. I, I mean, and, and no, no, rant. I love it. I love it because also the, the other thing that people don't ever think about or talk about, especially not in a film school, is the politics. The politics oh, of the set politics, the, you know, the money politics, the studio politics, the client politics, how you yeah. deal with, you know, you know, how you deal with people one on one psychology. There's just the psychology of dealing with human beings. I think every film school on the planet should have a at least one course on human psychology just basic human psychology yes. yeah i mean it's the most social job that you can take i mean <laughs> right. other than being like like a traffic cop i feel like it's like <laughs> whatever i i say this on the on the podcast 
whenever I, my, my morning for a director, like the way it works for me on set, like if you do your prep and directing is all about prep. Mm -hmm. So anywhere that you make your creative decisions, anywhere that the spot that you're going to do any of the stuff that you're known for by the audience, that's all prep shit. Mm -hmm. And then once you do your prep and if you're lucky enough and you find a producer and you find the money and you go through that hell and you get there, then your first day on the shoot, what I do is I typically show up early and then I just grab uh, something to drink, something to eat, and I walk around. And I, it's like movie sets to me are kind of like circuses. It's like Oh, they are. Circus. Oh, they're absolutely. We, we are all carnies. I've said that a thousand exactly. times. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So like, and it, it, it also, it also feels like you're at war. And so you have the front line, yeah. you have up front, and then. As you go further back, there are these different tents mm -hmm. that, that contain different departments. And so in the morning, I usually start with my breakfast and I'll just walk from tent to tent to tent mm -hmm. and go into these places and go like, how'd you sleep last night? How you doing? Oh, you having trouble with your husband today? Oh, that's terrible. Or like, what's going on with you? So you're just walking around being sort of like a psychologist. And, oh, yeah, right cool. <laughs> and you just make your way. And I love it because you slowly work your way forward towards the front line. And it's like you can almost see the battlefield as you're just making your way through the props guys who have been up all night. And the, the set designers and they haven't slept and they're filthy and they're just like, well, how do you think it looks? It's like, oh, let's go take a look at it. And then you come up to the front and usually up at the front line is the DP and you sort of sit in there and you guys just sort of come together. It's almost like you grab the binoculars and you're just sort of looking and going, okay, so what's coming at us today? You know, and it, 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 it's a lot of fun. Yeah? That's a great analogy. I mean, it, it's, 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 it is very, very, it's a great technique to walk around. I do that as well. Just kind of test out the test out the uh, the audience in your or your crew in the day because, like you said, if you've got a DP who's going through a divorce, you should probably kind of know that when yeah. you walk on the set that day because if not, I promise you, the second you say, "Hey, can you change that light?" All hell's gonna break loose. It has nothing to do with the damn light. <laughs> it's you're a psychologist, and 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 even if it's. On set, you're you're working with actors. You're dealing with oh, that's, yeah. people. Oh, God, you're all over the place. <laughs> yeah. But then prior to that, you're also like it's like you're running for office. So you're like this like public figure sort of campaign person, where there's this really weird balance of being confident but not cocky, uh, being uh, inspired but still open to great ideas, mm -hmm. and you're just sort of campaigning. You're vision and trying to take this this image that's in your head and learning how to put it into words so that they'll go into someone else's head and then it'll project on their screen the same way it projects on your internal screen it's 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 social shit and you're completely right they should be teaching psychology for directors oh god i mean so, uh, for psychology for dps or anybody like just generally it's just like and i've, I've worked with some of the biggest best you know craftsmen in the business as, as you have as well and when yep. you deal with with people at that level you know when they are you know I, I, many times i've been like they're so obviously i'm so out of my league sometimes with the people i get to work with sometimes <laughs> I'm like wow i'm i'm just here learning and i'm just so blessed to be in your presence but when you're in those kind of those kind of people uh in, in working with those kind of people who are at a just at a different level or if they've been doing it for 30 years or 40 years and and they just seen it all their energy their the the way they approach problems you know i i had michael goy on um the other day michael goy you know who michael goy is cinema he was he's like he he basically created the look for america horror story he's oh cool he's an amazing cinematographer and listening to him talk about uh about his process about what he does on set how he walks around, how he does a lot of the stuff he does. Cause he was like the, you know, he's TV. So it's a little bit different energy mm -hmm. and vibe, but the DP who, and he created this, the look of the, mm -hmm. of the stuff, how he, uh, how he, he just approached everything. You just could just sit there and go like, tell me more. <laughs> Some people, I always say this too. When you go out and you have beers with a group of guys right, yeah. or girls, whoever, mm -hmm. so you go out and have uh, a bunch of beers, you have those different, personalities that sit around the table yeah you have those people that uh can can tell great stories mm -hmm. so you have someone that sits down and they're like let me tell you about what i do with my day and then you have the people that listen to good stories and i think 
uh, great filmmakers, uh, no matter what department you're in, are the people that can be at that table and captivate you two or three people over beers. And you can really tell the difference. And I, I, I think a lot of people get into this business for different reasons. Um, this business is incredibly ego driven and no. there's a lot of ugh, stop. Oh, and there's a lot of that. There's a whole lot of like, I'm going to show you dad, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I try really hard to filter them out, you know, because a lot of times they're the client. No, I'm joking. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, 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 the client move. So how hard is it to be a director anyways? Like, like I love oh, ag agencies, agency guys. Oh, agency guys are the best. Uh, <laughs> they're oh. the best. It's because they know that their job is on a very thin line. Like the, the lifespan of agency dudes usually doesn't go past 30. I've met a couple yeah. of creatives that are in their 50s. And it's like, how the hell do you still exist? It's such a young person's business. Yeah. yeah. And you, you talk to these guys and I have quite a few of them. They're like, so uh, how do you, uh, are you, should I get a good camera if I want to be a director? Because I'm thinking about just going into direct. I'm like, dude, asshole. I've been doing this for like 18 years. And so suddenly you're going to jump off and just direct. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, just because you've been watching the process doesn't mean that doesn't you can mean do you the process. Know how to deal with it. I can listen to B Beethoven. Doesn't mean I can compose any music. <laughs> yeah, and half the problem is is you're not gonna know how to talk to yourself <laughs> as a director. So it's like <laughs> relax. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, relax. I now I wanted to touch on something that you brought up uh, when we in our kind of like our, uh, our when you reached out to me about mm -hmm. your near fatal accident yeah. that kind of changed your life i really want to ask you about that if you don't mind me talking if you don't mind talking about it sure so um uh, just to give a bit of context when i came back from film school i i went right to work mm -hmm. and i started my own company and then um for years i was uh i taught myself how to be a dp because i was a young uh, director and i couldn't convince all the dps to work with me mm -hmm. part of the reason why i grew a beard so young is that i needed to convince all the people to work lucas, with me. lucas spielberg got it yeah. So <laughs> did did that shit. Um, and so I uh, ended up doing uh, mostly commercials, mostly music videos, all that kind of stuff to sort of learn the craft. And I had been doing that for quite some time. Oh, God. I think this was like six years ago that this happened. Five years ago. Um, and so I was being very successful with it. But I, I, I've always wanted to direct features and I've always wanted to get into that. But I just didn't have the story to tell. So I'm spending most of my time just practicing technique and learning how to do these things, waiting for that story. Um, and I was on a date. So I went on a date with a girl. Always starts that way. Went on a date with a girl and um, or was dating her. And she came to me and she goes, look, I want to go ice skating. Now, at this point, I'm like 35 something like that. I've never put ice skates on. Oh, so this is not far. This is not too long ago. Not too long ago. Okay. So I'd never put ice skates on in my life. And <laughs> she's like, I want to go ice skating. And I was just trying to be cool, but blow it off. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, we'll go yeah, ice skating. I've been doing it a thousand times. Yeah. 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 So a couple of dates go by and she's like, when are we going to go ice skating? You never do what I want to do. And I'm like, okay, all right, fine. And in my head, I rationalize it like, okay, so maybe I'll twist an ankle or, you know, you know sprain something. It's still going to suck, but whatever, we'll do it. <laughs> So I go and it's here in Boston and I don't know if you know uh, Boston at all, but mm -hmm. downtown they have Frog Pond. So they have like this mm -hmm. big ice skating place. Mm -hmm. That time of the year, very romantic. People are all out. So I go down, really nervous, but playing chill. I put on these ice skates and uh, she drags me out onto the ice and she's sort of pulling me along on the ice and I'm getting impatient and I'm seeing all these little kids doing like pirouettes and stuff around me. <laughs> So the ego, just, the ego is just like, I can't believe just, Yeah, I just, I can't take this. <laughs> so I was just like, look, do me a favor. I'm holding you back. Go skate off and I'll figure this out. And she's like, okay. So she skates away. And I, there's a kid next to me and I watch him push off. And I was like, oh, no big deal. So I do the same thing. I push off. And what happens is, is I slip back all the way back. Oh. My feet go into the air and I land on the back of my head. Oh. And the, and the last thing I hear is an old oak barrel crack, and I'm out. So I'm out. And so she tells me that everybody in the ice hears it, and she comes skating over. And the people that are running the, the people that are running the ice skating rink are so freaked out, but they don't want to make a big deal over it. So they start ice skating out orange cones around my body so that they can continue to skate. So people are just skating around my body, and uh, she begs them to call the ambulance. So I wake up, I wake up, 
to a doctor staring at me, and he's looking down at me. And the first, I haven't taken a day off since I started. So the first thing I'm thinking is like, shit, I broke my leg. I have work next week, you know, and that's what's running through my head, you know. And priority, it's about priorities, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, "Look, here's the deal. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Uh, you've cracked your skull. Oh. You're, ble- you're bleeding internally. Uh, you have a hematoma forming on the top of your brain, which is pushing down on your brain." And normally what we do is we drill into your skull to release the pressure, but the hematoma is forming on the main blood vessel on your brain. So if we drill just a fraction uh, too deep, you bleed out and you die. So we're sort of talking here about what we're going to do next. What I'm thinking is that we're just going to see if the bleeding stops and then we'll go from there. Uh, You should call your family and you can't go to sleep. So we're going to keep you away. And so that started about 48 hours of st- of staying awake uh crazy hallucinations uh really bad shit uh m- mental things and then uh there's really great recordings actually i had the girl who stuck with me had the girl uh, recording it I'd, I'd sort of come out of like these waking nightmares and be like oh you gotta you gotta lay this down hold on like and i was convinced that the shadows on the wall were moving and i was convinced that my inner voice was being controlled by somebody else so it's just really wacky adventure um so i was in intensive care for five days the bleeding stopped uh after five days and then uh the doctor was like we're going to see if your brain will absorb the blood and now you have to recover from the concussions i had multiple concussions of course. um and so i went into five months of recovery <sighs> but the thing that was so inspi- the experience was so expiring inspiring that it um you know, the inner voice shit. And then I was put through sort of this medical, like this crash course into sort of mental, um, medical field. And then all this weird shit that happens with concussions. And I don't know how football players do it, Mm -hmm. but what a lot of people don't realize is that your brain is firing all the time and it's doing things that you don't realize it does. Mm -hmm. And it isn't until you're affected in some way or another that like one thing that blew my mind was that I lost the ability to filter out uh, external noise. So I couldn't have a conversation without hearing everything. Like literally everything would come in. So I'd hear someone breathing across the room. I'd hear the air conditioner in the other room. I hear cars on the street. I'd hear everything. And so it was just so physically exhausting to be in a conversation. And that went on for like a month. Oh. Um, so all this stuff was really, of course me, I'm, I, I'm totally into it. It's like an adventure. So <laughs> I was like, cool, I'm writing all this stuff down, and I had this really great idea. And so I started, in between headaches and migraines, I wrote a feature script for 12 Cam. That's where 12 Cam came from. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then once I recovered, uh, it came back out. My business partner at the time, I was like, five months later, I come back and I go, so I'm making a movie. Uh, I have a script that's written, and I'm going to do proof of concept. And let's get right into it. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a fun. I'm going to fundraise it and and pay for most of it. And let's go. And how did that? And then now, how did that experience change your trajectory? Did it do anything to you as far as putting things into perspective? Anything like that? Yeah, I mean, you have that. Okay, so I had one of those moments. We had like a. There was a couple like near death experiences. They. Stupid shit. Like, don't sneeze hard. You know what I mean? Because if you sneeze hard, the bleeding might start. And so, like, I had. You're terrified about sneezing. <laughs> yeah, I had a sneeze. You know what I mean? It was like, ah, you know, and like everybody piles in the car. We go to the hospital. And so. <laughs> sorry, that's funny. I mean, it's funny, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. Dude. It's hysterical. <laughs> and at the time, I was staying on the Cape and they're driving us to like one of the podunk hospitals on the Cape. Mm-hmm. And I swear that they run that place like the fucking Muppet show. The, the, the people just running around. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And so they go in and they run a CAT scan and they, the doc's like, oh, I think you're I think you, I think you, going to die. You know, it's like one of those things. I'm like, oh, shit. He's like, you got to drive up to Boston, which is like an hour and a half. And so that ride up to Boston, the whole time I'm just sort of like looking around at stuff going like, this is the last time I'm going to see trees and shit. Because I was like convinced that I like I was done. Um, and that whole period, I'm just sort of sitting there going, okay, what have I done with my life? I've been a successful music video director. I've done really great commercials. I've got a solid little company that's running well. I've got a great family. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've got this girl that loves me. I've got all this stuff that's going on. This is really great. My only fucking regret is that I never made a feature film. 
I was like, that was uh-huh. it. That was my only regret. And, you know, out of all things to be, it's like, okay, so if I go, you know, but uh, when I got out, I was like, look, if I get out of this, no more wasting time. Like you have a good idea. You have a, a great sort of story. You have this inspiration. You got to jump into it. So it's like you earn, sort of earn that time. You know what I mean? Now, now let me ask you, because this is something that I find very interesting because we're both similar vintages as far as our age is concerned. Yeah. It took me till I was 41 to make my first feature. And, and it took, wait, how old were you? 30? Oh, Eight. so I, I haven't made the feature yet. Oh, so, so you're still you're still on the journey trying to get it made. I'm on the journey, man, and and, and at this point, it's probably going to be about your age, probably about 41. All right, yeah. so both of us at this point had at at, at the point at 30, you and I both had the skills yep. to make a feature film. Yep, we could have done it on a budget. We could have grabbed something. We could have had that. We had the resources, but yet we didn't. I know what my reason was because I built up this monster that was the feature film, even though I was doing commercials and music videos and shows and other things like that. I built this yeah. just literally a boogeyman, a monster giant because it had to be Reservoir Dogs. First film out had to be Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> had to be Mariachi. Had to be Clerks. Had to be, you know, all those, all those films that came out in the 90s when we were coming up. Like, yep. it, that was it. And it had to be that. Like, if I had to show up, it had to show up like guns a blaring, you know? Yeah. So that kind of pressure, of course, you're just never going to move. It was just too right. much stress. So for you, what was it that stopped you from doing it? Because I've seen your work. You're more than capable of making a feature film at a high and really high quality. So tell me, in your in your opinion. I think it's a couple things. One, I made a decision. I made a decision when I was younger because I was in New York. Mm. And I could have stayed in New York. And I made a decision going, look, I had produced three movies in New York City without family, without context, without any of that shit. And I was like, I I can do this, but imagine what I could do in a city that I grew up in and imagine what I can get with all these different resources. So I I ended up coming back here and doing all that stuff back here, which was one of the coolest things I did because I learned how to do this stuff in a backwards way. So this whole I, I didn't go intern for, you know, Ridley Scott. I didn't go do that, which would have taught me the the conventional way of doing stuff. I, I sort of did it my own way, which is great because my style is kind of dictated by that. Now, when I sit in a room with like Ridley Scott and all those guys, they're like, well, how'd you come up with all this? And I'm like, oh, cool. I did it my way. And I sort of did that. Um, the negative of that is that it just takes longer. Mm-hmm. So like that. It's like, it's, it's the difference between searing a steak and doing like a, a, a slow cooker. You know mm-hmm, what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and it was like a long, slow cook process. So I think not being on the sets and not being there and seeing how relatable those sets are affected that. And then I ended up like you, where you're sort of sitting there going like, oh, these things are so big and they're so... I can't make control. Blade Runner. Like, I can't do yeah, Blade Runner I can't now. do that shit, you know? Because <laughs> that's so... That's so, I'm in Boston and that's so LA. Right. You know what I mean, so right. it's like so far away from it. Um, I think that's a big part of it. And then as I started to direct and I started to get more comfortable dealing with talent, because there was that whole period, I'm a technical dude. So for me, it's, it's uh, cinematography, image. You can tell by my work. It's very much uh, visual storytelling. Mm-hmm. That's what I love to do. Uh, and then there was a period of time, probably like seven years ago, where I was crossing the hurdle with actors and I'm like, I've never acted myself. I've never taken any acting courses. So then it's like, how do I communicate? Cause I'm so good at communicating with all the tech guys. How do I take this and communicate it now with emotional people? And so that took me a few years to figure that out. Um, and I'm happy I went through that, but all those things sort of take your time. And I was so focused on just becoming really great at it. Just going like, here's how to run a really good set. Here's how um, we haven't even talked about like, here's how to stay inspired. Here's how to come up with great ideas quickly. Here's, here's how to flex my muscles as a, as a writer or as a conceptor, Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, which took a fuckload of time. So Mm -hmm. uh, once I hit a point, we were doing a couple, I did a short film. I did a short film, a fan film, uh, a Punisher fan film that Marvel, Marvel shut down on me. (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> I was going to ask you about the Punisher fan film. Yeah, dude. I did this movie because I was doing a music video. I did a music video for uh, Czarface, which is Inspect the Deck and 7 Hour Esoteric. And I was doing this, this hip hop video. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. And now back to the show. And they had this bit where we had them kidnap this guy and they were torturing a guy in a basement. We had him in a bucket, very like lethal weapon style, like sure, sure, chained sure, up yeah, and they're yeah. electrocuting him. And I'm shooting this stuff anamorphic and I'm looking at the monitor going like, why the fuck are we not doing this as a movie? Um, and I was reading a, this really great Punisher run by Greg Rucka at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was in, and fan films were kind of doing okay online. And I'm like, why don't we just do this? Like I could take this that I'm shooting and then just do this and mm-hmm. we'll just do a short and then maybe I'll pitch it. This is pre Netflix. Yeah. Pre all that stuff. Maybe I'll pitch it to Marvel. Maybe we'll do some sort of online short thing. Um, and so I got all my, my dudes together and we shot a really beautiful piece. We shot a really cool little short for the Punisher bit. Um, and I made the grave mistake. Oh no. Of- you asked for permission. No. Oh, okay. What I did, what I did cause I, I'm also a photographer and all that shit. So I, I made a poster and then I, I cut together a teaser mm-hmm. and, and I just sent them out and the poster and the teaser got reposted on like CBR, like all these big sure, websites. Sure, sure. And then they're writing like shit, like better than Mar- anything Marvel's ever done at the time. They're writing these fucking articles. So all that stuff is coming out and I'm in the process of just still shooting and editing. And that's when I get the cease and desist. And Marvel comes with a cease and desist, and they're like, hey, look, you, you got to stop. And I get it. Look, I don't own the property. I don't own that stuff. I totally understand. And I said to them, I'm like, look, guys, I'm not making any loot on this. You can fucking have it. Like, let me just make it, and then you can have it. You can release it. You can do whatever you want with it. No response from them. Uh, I get understand legally why. Um, and then, you know, I love Marvel. I was a comic book kid, so sure. I don't want to. I don't want to piss those fuckers off. And especially at this point where it's like Disney, you know yeah. what I mean? Like there's no, I don't want to get in that game. And you know, my lawyers at the time were like, they won't screw you now. They'll, they'll get on you when you're good. You know? So like you decide what you want to do with this. And he actually, the lawyer was like, you should just write an article on what you did. And th- because I was so concerned about my crew, and all the talent, all these mm-hmm. people that I had that done this and no one could see it. But it was when I was shooting that that I was sitting there going like, I can do this as a feature. And then then you're dealing with the next thing, which is like, yeah, but who's going to pay for it? You know what I mean? like, right. So then your next step is like, sure, I can now do this, but that now who's going to fund the fucking thing? But, so, let me, but let me ask you a question, though. Couldn't you have, I mean, you, obviously you did the mistake because you, you released the teaser and the poster prior to the movie being made or finished yeah. at least. Because yeah. if you would have just put the, the short out there. Then what are they going to do? The out. It's out. So after they sent the cease and desist, you arguably could have still just released it, and they wouldn't have because the press would have been horrible, and they wouldn't have messed with you. But they would I, have screwed you some other way later down the line. That's the that that's the thing. And you, you know, you make the mistake of talking to the lawyers and stuff. Yeah. And so you know, at that point, I had a business partner, so he had a family. He had kid. He's got all that sort of stuff. So then you're sort of sitting there going like, okay, look, realistically what do I want from this? You know, and you know, at the end of the day, it was smart for me not to release it because it became such a mythical thing. It's like that punk rock album that no one's been able to hear. Right. And, and and now it's, there's such a mythos around it that I don't want to put it out because I don't think it will ever live up to the mythology. But you have it finished. You finished it for yourself. I have like a finished version of it. Yeah. I was going to have it be longer, but I do have a finished version that sometimes if I'm having screenings, it might be on there. What? Well, yeah. No, of course yeah. not. Of course you, you never know. You yeah. never know. But, um, but that was really cool in the long run because that was the crew that I dry, basically dry ran for 12 km mm-hmm. 
which y- your audience doesn't know anything about that yet. 12 Cam is a movie, basically, in the 1980s, a Russian drill team uh, dug the deepest hole known to man. And uh, there's this myth that's sort of circling around the internet. I think it's created by like a Christian or Catholic league um, that they lowered microphones down into the planet and they heard the screams of hell. And I had heard about this story <laughs> years before my head injury. Sure. And so when I was uh, writing the head injury thing, I needed sort of a uh, a backstory of like where this creature came from. And I was like, all right, the whole the whole whole thing. And so. We wrote this bit and I decided to make uh, a short film, but because my crew, I get so emotionally invested with the people that I work with because my crew, I felt like I, I did them in, in just like an in-service, like a, like a, I fucked them over basically by not putting the movie out. I went, look, if I'm going to make another short, I'm going to make something that I could screen in a the theater. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's going to have a three act structure. So it's going to be a bit longer. Um, and so I'll just take the cold open of my movie that takes place in Russia and make it bigger. Uh, and so I, I wrote this piece. And then since I was the boss, I was like, let's do it in Russian. Mm-hmm. Because I hate it when you see American movies in different countries and they're speaking with just Russian accents. So I was like, we'll do it in Russian. I don't know how to speak Russian. So I'll we'll bring in translators and we'll try to make all that work. Um, and that began the crazy uh, adventure with 12 cam well now you've done you've done a handful of these proof of concepts you did uh the who's there concept yep. uh, film as well let's i want to talk a little bit about proofs of concept in general because that's something i've been asked a lot in my career i've done them um yep. i've created worlds around my some properties that i created that at the end just could not get the traction it was just very difficult to package you know how it is to package a film to get stars attached to it's just a it's a headache um yes. so how has it worked for you and is it working for you has you ever been has any of these proof of concepts actually relate finished doing a, a film or at least getting close to it or what's the process and what do you what do you say about it so i did i did 12 cam so it's, it ended up being a 30 minute movie and my my goal for that was like hey we'll go to festivals yeah you know We'll go to festivals and then maybe we'll meet somebody at festivals. And so when I'm when I'm cutting, I have this process that I do when I'm editing, yeah. where I'll I have groups of people that I bring in at different stages. So like and I know what their reactions will be. So I bring them in just to get their reactions. And towards the end of it, I knew a couple festival programmers, and I'm like, just come in and watch this fucking thing. And so I'd get them in, they watch the movie, and they're like, it's awesome. I'm like, cool. I'm like, yeah. And I was like, so what do you think? Am I going to have trouble getting this in the festivals? I go, yeah, you're not going to get this in any festivals. And I'm like, okay, well, why not? And they're like, because it's 30 minutes. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah but the festivals all say that they'll take up to 40 minutes. Mm-mm. And they go, they're not going to program it. No. Because if they program your short, they're going to lose three shorts. And I said, yeah, but mine's good. And they go, yeah, but they're still not going to program it. It's hard. Um, it's very hard. I had a 20 minutes. I, I had a 20 minute short. I know, I know, I know how that feels. And so I said to him, okay, okay, cool. So what would you cut? So you're watching this thing. What do you think I should cut out of it? And they're like, don't cut anything. We love it. I'm like, okay, so I'm screwed. <laughs> it's what you're saying. I'm screwed. And they're like, well, you can try. We have some connections. We'll send it around. We'll see. So I did the whole festival thing. Spent fucking like eight, nine hundred dollars on mm-hmm, submissions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? And so I sent the thing out and got into like two. Um, and then it was just so disappointing. And one thing, one thing I learned after doing the Punisher piece was the power of the internet and the power of articles and the power of all that stuff. So I started to put together sort of an internet campaign around the short and I wouldn't release the short. I just released the trailer. So I had like a little teaser for it and I had a bunch of different articles written. I was getting a little bit of traction and I had a friend of a friend write to me, uh, and she, uh, Izzy Lee and she wrote for Twitch film, Mm -hmm. I think at the time which I had never heard of at the time. Yeah. And she's like, hey, can I, can I cover and review your movie? And I was like, sure, here you go, take it. Um, and I had done some other articles that I thought were going to be the shit for a bunch of other people. Nothing happened on that. And then she releases the article. And in that week, uh, I had Netflix call me. I had another studio call me. And then I got this phone call from a guy claiming to be a manager. And, uh, I don't know if it's the same way for you, but whenever I hear someone <laughs> calling to do that, I imagine some asshole in a closet in a polyester suit 
on a phone just going like, I manage people. You know what I mean? First so of all, Korea, polyester suit, that's you're taking it way too high class. I, <laughs> I, I don't even think in my in my mind, it's a dude in a Hawaiian shirt, <laughs> no AC in the middle of the summer somewhere in Van Nuys. But yeah, anyway. Like, <laughs> Gene, Gene Hackman from Get Shorty. You know? It's exactly what I think. Uh so you know, so I, I was like, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, because I had I had been repped for commercial stuff by people for a while. So I was like, yeah, you know, and he's like, look, I'm a manager and I do all this stuff. So I get off the phone with him and, and the guy, I ended up teaming up with a really longer story, but I ended up teaming up with a great uh, writer who works in Hollywood to write, to rewrite the feature version of 12 Camp. And so he's rep by UTA. He's rep by a bunch of different places. And uh, Will Simmons is his name. And um, he called me right away. So as soon as I hang up the phone with this, this manager, I get a call from him. He's like, I hear you're talking to this company. And I was like, how the fuck? Wait, like, I just where's literally, the cameras? Like, I just, what are you, bugging my house? Like, I just literally hung up the phone. He goes, no, I know people that work in the office and they were, your name's been going around the office. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, they're good, they're a good company. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah. And uh, at the time, we, him and I wrote a, a feature version, a new feature version. Um, and then we were packaging the short with it. And he had connections with, I could say the name. He had connections with Platinum Dudes, mm -hmm. so Michael Bay's company. Sure. So, so he's oh, like, "This is a Platinum. This, this does have a flavor of Platinum Dudes, no question." <laughs> yeah. So he's like, "He's like, do you want to? Let's go pitch it to Platinum." And I was like, "Okay." So you know, I got on the airplane. This is my first time really pitching anything. So I, I get on the airplane and I'm flying out. And the management company is like, "Look, come see us and pitch it to us first. And if we like the pitch, then we'll send you out." Uh, and so we go to this place and, uh, I go meet them on my own first. And that, like I said, I'm, I'm picturing like a, you know, like a fucking strip mall and like a little office. And so I go and it's like this giant fucking building and it's like, you know, uh, uh Leonardo DiCaprio's production offices are in there, like all this stuff. And I'm just sort of in the lobby going like, Oh shit. <laughs> <You know what laughs> I ain't mean? in Kansas anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like, Whoa. Okay. And so go up. Mm -hmm. Into this place, and um, I can say it's Gotham Group. It's a really amazing a management company. Yeah, I've heard of them. And, uh, I heard of. Them. I, I hear yeah, good things. <laughs> yeah, Justin Justin Littman is my manager. So I go up and meet him for the first time, and you know they do their thing. Like I, I, I watch Entourage, so like there hits this point where it's like you know the assistants are like Mike, 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 and everybody just comes over and does, and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and I'm East Coast, so I'm just like, really nice to meet you, but you know, you guys don't have to be doing this shit. Let's just get right to it. And so we go in and we pitch to these dudes, and uh, uh, Will's uh, agent from UTA is on the phone, all that kind of stuff. So we do our pitch, and they're all like, "Oh, we love it. We can we can sell this." And so instantly, I sign with them. And then while I'm out there, they extend my time out there in LA, so I'm out there for like 11 days. And Will and I, who on actually, Will and I have been writing together over the phone. We haven't spent time in the same room together. Mm -hmm. So we we take that weekend and go on our first date. We hang out. We sort of do all that. Uh, and then the two of us learn our pitch where we're both going in a room. So it's like a presentation where like I say something, he says something, and, blah, 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 and we work this really good pitch thing out. Um, and then we go on this adventure and they book us. Uh, we, you pitch to production companies first because you have to get a producer attached. And then once you get a producer attached to it, then they go out for financing and then they go for that. So we ended up pitching to like 11, 12 of some, like these are production companies, like directors Ridley, with Ridley Scott like movies. Ridley Scott. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and then like we, we went everywhere, like Michael Bay's offices, uh, Sam Raimi's offices, yeah. like the whole, the whole run. And it was like every time I'd show up and be like, and this is the first time for me. Oh, so I know. Such a I, magical. I, oh, yeah. Magical moment. <laughs> you know. How and, old were you? How old were you when this was going on? A few. This is a few years ago. It's a few years ago. Right. So, so you. you like, but you see, like this happened to me when I was in my early twenties. So that, uh, that yeah. different, different vibe back then. You know. Yeah. So you were a little bit more seasoned, a little bit more grizzled. You know. But it's still like I'm cool, but I know who I am. But exactly. And you go into the room and you're like, look, I've been, because I've been pitching for commercials and music yeah, videos yeah, and hanging yeah. out with celebrities for years. So that really doesn't get me. I mean, I get a little starstruck with certain directors. Sure. Maybe directors that made movies about aliens and robots and shit. Yeah. You know, and, like that. and sound yeah. like Aid Unner. Right. Got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those people. But, you know, 
some of the other ones I'm like, this is really cool. It's cool to see what, what you're doing. And when you yeah. go into these offices, it's like, oh, these are very small offices. This is manageable. And you go in there and you look around and you go, I get it. Like beyond that amazing shiny logo, it's like, this is what it actually is. All right. This is, I could do this. You're sort of walking through there going like, cool. And the thing that was really great is, it, and this comes back to what we, you asked about concepts. Yeah. And stuff. Yeah. Having a great proof of concept. Um, and if uh, we could talk about how your listeners could see 12 cam, but mm -hmm. having a really great proof of concept basically takes all the bullshit out of it. So I can, my, my management, the way that they set up the meetings, they just took the short film, put together an email, sent it an email and said, shut the lights off, put on headphones and watch this. Like you have to watch this. And so I got to go to these places where they had already seen everything. Mm -hmm. So I got to step into a room and instead of having to go in there and pitch, I'd walk in the room and they already have questions. Like yep. stuff like, it's exactly how, much was, yeah. how much was your budget? Like, oh my God, how did you do this? And how come you're not Russian? Like all these really weird questions that were coming at me. So it was, it was a great experience for that because they knew immediately based upon my proof of concept, what my style is, you know, what my voice is, uh, and what I can pull off. Mm -hmm. So it really sort of pulls away a good portion of that bullshit that you usually have to do. And it's like, oh, I'm really frugal on set where these guys would look at stuff <laughs> and Sorry, literally go, great. yeah, yeah. They go like, how many days did you shoot? Oh, I shot for seven days total. How many setups per day did you do? 35. Holy shit. 35 setups. Yeah. Dolly, steady cam, this and this. Holy shit. And if I had gone into a room and said that to producers without that, they'd be like, yeah, this kid doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Right, right, right. Exactly. You know, and even though I'm 40, you still get that. Like, listen, kid, like that still comes out. And I'm like, you're 35. <laughs> you can't say to me, listen, kid, you're 35, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so it's it's funny listening to you. It's exactly what happened to me when I did my proof of concepts. And just walking in, and people would ask, and you'd get into these these rooms, and and people start asking you. But then, of course, all the all the struggles come up, and like, oh, but who's going to get attached? We need it. We need who can we get attached to the project? And once we attach somebody, then then we have to find financing for it, and. And then they start all the foreign sales and can you change the character from being Latina to being yeah. this? Or can you make the, instead of a female lead character, can we make it a male lead character? And it's just like, and then that, that whole game starts. Dude, it's the swirl. I mean, we did that with 12 cam, uh, two years ago. Mm -hmm. It's like two years ago, something like that. Um, we ended up hooking up with the best possible scenario, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it mm -hmm. yet. Okay. But I, you know, out of all those places, mm -hmm. this is probably a place that does some pretty amazing stuff that I really like that I may have already said on the show, but I, you never know. Yeah. Um, so we're, we teamed up with one of those spots, and right now we're going through that talent attachment thing. Oh, which, brutal. Which and, is brutal. And it takes forever. Dude, I got so <laughs> frustrated, and, and I'm going to talk about it. I don't give a fuck. I got so frustrated over the Christmas season because it's like, Mm -hmm. We're waiting for we're waiting for one actor specifically to to read the fucking thing, <laughs> and it's not that the actor's not reading it. There's so many fucking layers between mm -hmm. you and the talent. There are so many people that have their own opinions that they're basing agendas, on like yeah, agendas, and maybe reading three pages of the fucking thing. And so it's so sprawled out. And I know that if I get in a room with people. Mm -hmm. I can get people really amped. That's what I'm, I'm good at. I can get people really pumped about it. So I keep saying like, put me in the room, put me in the room, put me in the room. It, but like agents and management, like I got signed by UTA immediately after that. So it's really great. So all those dudes are there and I'm like, put me in the room, put me in the room. And everybody's like, yeah, you know, there's steps and there's processes. And I'm sitting back here at home and I'm like, fuck this. Like, I don't know how to do, to get past this point. And so I just started making videos. So now I make videos for actors where I will make videos like we're doing where I'm like, here's, here's the project. Here's who I am. Here's what's happening. Uh, this is what I really like. And this is how I see you in it. And I'll, I'll edit it really cool. Oh, and then nice. I send it. And then I send it to my guys and I go, guess what? This is uh, small enough to fit on your fucking iPhone. So here's what you're going to do. Uh, just text it to the actor. That's it. So that way you can skip everything. Just fucking text it. 
to the actor so that they can read it and they can look at it and they can watch it. Yeah. And so that's where that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> that is a really brilliant idea. Like that's first of all, that's hustle. I love that. And yeah. it is a great way to cut through a lot of the BS that you have to deal with. Because it's you're right, man. Look, man, I've I've I wrote a whole book about this pro one of my pro one of these journeys of mine. You know, like you're just sitting there and you're dealing with a, a, uh, agents and managers and lawyers and then handlers around the uh, around the actor and the bigger the actor the worse it gets like it's and i ne i never fault the actor no it's just I, it's just the world because that we live because i see it from my perspective because we'll, i'll get scripts sent to us or to me and i'll read scripts and i know how that game works and i'll get them filtered down through the run and i know that the actor is just like who's this guy what has he done after he goes through all that shit that's coming at him where it's just like, you know, we think this is a really good idea. And there's a lot of that that comes at me where they're like, we think this is a really good idea. And you look at it and you go, this is shit. You know? Mm -hmm. And so all they have at that point is to go like, who's this director? What's he done? You know? And, and maybe if maybe they go online and they look me up online. Maybe. But do you have, I mean, so you wor you're, you've worked with, you're working with a company that shall remain nameless, but that uh -huh. company has probably some producers that are well known. Yes. Let's say. Yes. Do you find that having a producer, so let's say, and I'm, let's say Spielberg, I know it's not Spielberg, but let's say Spielberg, like I vouch for this kid and Steve calls up Leonardo and says, hey, check this, it's, check 12KM out. I think it might be, that's going to cut through a lot of BS. Okay. Yes, I agree. But let's pretend like it's, let's pretend like it's a guy like Spielberg. Mm -hmm. Let me the phrases. Let's pretend like it's like that. Mm -hmm. So directors, for a lot of folks that don't understand how it works, directors that have be, uh, become successful uh, usually tr start or already have their own little production company or a little yeah. development company. And so like, if you make a successful film, then with a studio, you can often get like a first look mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. So like you get a first look deal with Warners, you get a first look deal with Paramount, whatever the fuck that is. And so uh, James Wan, like James Wan's company, for instance, James Wan, who has Atomic Monster, they have a first look with Warner Brothers. Um, James, I've met with uh, Atomic Monster guys, love those guys, love to work with those guys. Um, I didn't meet with James Wan. So I went in and I met with James, Wan, James Wan's partners. So you go in and usually you're meeting with like a junior exec. Or you're meeting, I've been lucky enough to meet with some of his big execs, which is great. So you go and you sit in the room and they like it and they will sign with it and they'll do it. And, and I've only had with the guy that I'm dealing with, I've only had those exchanges with the producers and the execs that work with him. Um, to you never, point, but never him. I, I almost, I was in the office one day. Uh, pitching to a, a couple of uh, uh, financiers, um, and uh, he was there, and and I had I I had never met him, and he was there, and the it's a funny story. And I, see, the, I see I see I see your eyes twinkling now all of a sudden yeah. when you bring him up. <laughs> yeah, I'm being I'm just trying to be as vague as possible. I understand. <laughs> and the and the producers, we were supposed to have like a conference room, and the producers were all flustered because all of a sudden the director was there and he and the head of the company was there and he's like i need all the conference room so like it was this big deal and so <laughs> and so they're like all right we have we have to re redo this meeting we're gonna do it in this small little office and they bring me into this little office not really a small office they bring me into this office and i look around and it's the office of this director it's like this amazing office and so like i'm i'm in this office mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm looking around all over the place and the producer's there and he's like, I think we'll do it on the couch here. We'll have them come in and we'll talk here and we'll do all this. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. And he's like, do you want coffee? And I don't drink coffee. Yeah. I never drink coffee. And I go, yeah, yeah. And he goes, uh, <laughs> what kind of, what kind of coffee do you want? And I go, whatever takes you the longest to come back here. And so he leaves the room and I'm just walking around with my phone, just going concept art, concept art, statue, statue, bit, 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 bit. <laughs> just taking pictures <laughs> of the <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're basically just geeking out. You're straight up oh, geeking straight out. Straight out geeking out. So I had this moment. And so they come <laughs> back and we have this pitch meeting. And there's something cool about being able to pitch and point at concept art from big movies while you're pitching. Yeah. And so I have I have this pitch thing. And then um, they're like, he's here. And they're like, do you want to meet him? And I'm like, no. Mm -mm. 
I'm like, what do you mean? I was like, he's stressed out. He's here. He's working. The last thing I want is for one of you guys to walk me into a fucking conference room where he's dealing with shit. And then they go, hey, hey, this is uh, this is Mike. Remember, he did that little Russia movie. And I don't want to have that exchange. I don't want him to be like, I'm trying to deal with millions of dollars and turn and go, who? Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Great. Shake hand. Walk out. That's not what I want. <laughs> right. They were like, no, I want to have coffee. Like, I want to sit down with him. Exactly. I was like, I want to, nope. I want to nope. twizzle our hair, you know, braid our hair together. I mean, I want, I want a moment. <laughs> no, it, it, and so like that was a while ago. And then I've done quite a few meetings with him since. And I'm always testing them because, uh, they're like, you know, uh, he likes the movie. I almost said his name. He likes, he likes the movie. And uh, I was like, sure. And the, the first time yeah, I had heard yeah, that yeah, they were yeah. pitching it to the financiers were like, he thinks that Mike's one of the, the next director to come out of this company and really great. And I heard that for the first time with the financiers and I was just like, Whoa, you know? And so afterwards I was like, it's a good line of bullshit that you guys feed, you know, to the dudes. Cause you know, East coast guy. You're so East coast, dude. I'm just, I'm like smelling it. Like I, oh, I can smell yeah. my own. It's just great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, it's a good, good lot of bullshit that you pee. And they go, no, it's serious. He fucking saw the short and he likes short. He sees a ton of shorts and he really likes short. And I go, yeah, that's cool. But in the back of my head, I'm like, mm-hmm. and so, you know, a couple of other times that I've been and hung out with him, I just test him. I'm like, so has he seen the movie? And they go, yep. And I go, yeah, what do you think? And I'm like, he loves it. Says the same line that he did before. And I'm like, oh, so maybe he has seen it. And so, and it wasn't until I met with another director, who I'm actually Zach Merck, who I'm actually going to have in my podcast this afternoon, um, who is also also somehow connected. I'm not giving it away. Also <laughs> somehow connected. Um, he heard about it. Uh-huh. And he was there and he was like, oh, yeah, I heard him talking about it. And I was like, whoa. And it was at that moment where it's just <laughs> brain blew up. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. like a little, little dude from Boston shooting a movie in Russia in a tiny little suburb. And then now I'm here. And even though the movie hasn't been made yet, even though we're still in development, just learning in this long process to appreciate. And it takes a lot of work. My girl is always trying to get me to do it. She's like, take a moment. I know you're being fucking cynical. Take a moment and understand where you are. And it's like, oh, right, right, yeah, right. Okay, cool. Enjoy the, enjoy cool. the journey, man, because you didn't, yeah. honestly, you don't know if it's going to happen again. Yeah, crazy, I, man. It, it is, it is a, it is a journey, and you just, it just enjoy the, enjoy the ride while you're going on it. It might be painful, it might be like, God damn it, but like, <laughs> I promise you, God, since I've gone through it a few times in my career, you just got to enjoy the ride because you just don't know if or when it'll come back around. Uh, it is a rarity. It is. It's a unicorn. Dude. It really is a unicorn, especially when we're just trying to come up. It, it is a unicorn experience. So enjoy it. As frustrating as it might be. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I've just got to the point where like, I understand that, you know, I say this in the podcast, I understand that as a director, I direct probably 9% of the year. Mm-hmm. So most That's of this a lot. is, <laughs> yeah. And that's because I do commercials. Because right. I do that. So most of this is what my job is. Mm -hmm. So all of this, like you and me talking, like Mm -hmm. all of this is what my fucking job is. So you got to really love it. And that's what my, you know, plug in my own podcast here. That's what my podcast is about. It's in love with the process. It's like, how do you stay sane for the amount of time that it takes for any of this stuff to happen? And Mm -hmm. then for those people that are just waiting to get on the stage, for those people that are just waiting to go like, this is mine. It's awesome, right? And then that literally lasts for minutes. maybe a week. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, and then it's fucking gone. And so I really learned this early on where it's like, I really have to fall in love with all these little things. I have to fall in love with these little steps. And mm-hmm. and and that's the life. The life is like Tuesday location scouting in a fucking abandoned power plant or like Wednesday hanging out with a potential person that you're going to work with six years from now. Like that's what this is. Um, and that's kind of what I promote and that's what I talk about because I feel like, and you guys do, you do a great job with your podcast. It's sort of the same way where most of what people are sold these days is all propaganda. Mm-hmm. So it's straight propaganda. Like, this is how cool I am. This is how fucking cool my Instagram is. This right. is all that shit. Filters everywhere, right? Everywhere. And everybody has <laughs> to do, it's that fucking pitch all the time. Everybody has to pitch it. And, uh, you know, it's what gear do you own? And like, you're not a professional unless you're fucking in debt with your gear. Yeah, you need to shoot 8K. 8K constantly. <laughs> 
that's a whole other podcast, a whole other oh, conversation, shit. dude. Like, I yeah. just, like, I literally, you should see people's face. My last film I shot, I shot on 1080p on a, po- on a pocket camera, the black magic pocket camera. Yeah. It looks stunning. I love it. It's one of the best looking things I've ever shot. And people are like, but you shot in 1080. I'm like, yeah, I did. I even zoomed in a little bit in the 1080 and fixed it a little bit in post because I, I, I'm a colorist, so I could do that. And it looks yeah. fantastic. It was great. Instead of lugging around a red or lugging around an Alexa or these big monster cameras, this, it was perfect for the kind of film I was trying to make. It was Dude, great. I, I learned that doing music videos because when we were doing music videos, me and uh, my old business partner, Ian, um, we were doing stuff for MTV. So MTV still existed. So we were doing like a lot of heavy metal stuff. We were doing a lot of like hip hop stuff. We wrote treatments for Ozzy, all that kind of shit. And we would shoot stuff on fucking mini DV. <laughs> so we would use like old school mini DV cameras with a, a glass adapter so we could put lenses on it. So you were, you were looking, you were using the DVX 100A, were you? The yeah, Panasonic? We were, doing, we were doing some Panasonic. Yes. We were, Canon we doing, maybe? Like, XL2s, you yeah. we were doing like yeah, a lot yeah. of that shit. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And we would shoot videos that would be broadcast next to 35 millimeter. <laughs> and people would, would, would say to us, because you'd get those nerds, and people would say to us, like, so that, that was obviously like reversal, you know, 35 millimeter. Maybe it was like 16, you know, and you're just like, it was, it was mini DV, dude. It was, it was mini DV yeah. in a camera. It doesn't make a difference. Like, tell the story. I always, I always say this, man, like an audience, as long as you set it up right, an audience will forgive aesthetics. As long as the aesthetics make sense, they will not forgive sound. Yeah. So you, if you're going to, if you're worried about tech, worry about sound. And a lot of people don't. It's like, worry about how your recording sound, worry about how it sounds, worry about your mix. Because aesthetically, look at Blair Witch. You know what I mean? Like you can make a, you can run around with a handy, shaky hand cam throw away any sort of visual stuff in the audience as long as the story's engrossing and as long as it sounds good mm-hmm. they'll stick with it you know what i mean so that so the answer so this was a very long answer to a short question but sorry <laughs> <laughs> which has been sorry. fantastic no no don't apologize it's been fantastic because i asked you originally are proof of concepts worth it and i think we've established in the last 25 minutes that <laughs> That no, it, because it's it's a concept. I've really never talked a lot about that specific thing because I I'm still bitter. You're you're not bitter yet of the proof of concept journey. I've gone through it at least two to three times with different projects over the course of my career. So I'm bitter at proof of concepts because I see that they kind of go real far, but then they, ah ah ah, and then well, but you're still in that process, and you're obviously gotten to a place that you're a little bit farther along. Um, sure. Than where I've I was. Got, I've, got, I've got two. So yeah, exactly. The uh, who's there as well. It's great. Twelve cam is is uh, with that guy, and then uh, uh, who's there is about to be with somebody else. So, right. So it's working. But the thing is that the proof of concept does, if you're good, will maybe not even get the movie made, maybe not even get the project made, but it will get you um, attention, production and company attention. They're like, hey, you know, this is not going to work. This Russian thing, you know, we can't get anybody attached. But we got this other thing because we love your aesthetics. Would you be interested in reading this script? And all of a yep. sudden, and that movie's got about three, four million attached to it already. So do you want yep. that movie? That's what can happen from it. But it's so difficult for filmmakers who put all their, I mean, you've put your heart and soul. I mean, it was literally a, a sure. near death experience to help you create this. So you're attached emotionally to this proof of concept, to this story. But I think you're also at a different stage in your career where if someone said, you know, we're well, not going to make the Russian thing, but we're going to give you this. And it's pretty damn cool. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, for me, like I say this all the time, like I, I don't have, I got great stories to tell, um, but I don't have the story that I feel like is like uh, I'm going to release and it's going to change the world socially. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, I like to make great adventure movies. I like to make scary adventure movies, um, and I'm in this business for the life. I'm in this business for the creative. Uh, um, I, I'm my, I forget what they, how they call it, but I'm more of a, I'm a job guy. So for me, it's, I want to have the ability to continue to hire the people that I work with. I want to have the ability to continue to spend my days. I'm going to drop dead on set. You know what I mean? Like, like I, that's what I want. I just did a shoot last week, actually two days ago, um, where I brought together a bunch of people. We shot on Super Bowl fucking Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, brought together a bunch of people that I love. We all shot for 10 hours, and then we brought in dudes, smoked ribs, and brought in food, and had a huge Super Bowl party. And it was 
amazing. I'm still recovering from it. It was, mm-hmm. it was just such a great experience. That's what I want to do. I mean, if you work with me on my sets, they're fun. Uh, they're challenging. Um, and they're family. And so I see what I have to do for the pitching and all this stuff as almost like being dad and going out and getting the ability so that my family can t- continue to work. Um, that's awesome. And that's kind of why I want to do it, man. And so if, and I've had scripts sent to me and there's a couple that I would work on. Um, if someone comes to me and goes, look, it's not time for 12 KM, I'd go, okay, it will be at some point, but sure. All right. You want me to do some exorcism movie? If I connect to the material and if I think my style is going to work with it and I'm inspired by it, I'm in, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm totally in. You want to do a reboot of nightmare on Elm street? I am in. Like I would love, would yeah. love to do that because I, I'm jealous of Spielberg. Of course, I, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of that period of time where I feel like the audience wasn't as sophisticated. In on the, they're not if sophisticated as a way to put it, but it's like right now all the magicians are showing you how the magic fucking happened. Yeah, there you didn't know. You didn't know. And so at that time period, like Jurassic Park was the first time that they were really going like, these dinosaurs aren't real. But it wasn't until after Jurassic Park came out, because I remember going to watch that movie and going like, how the fuck did they get dinosaurs? Like, (laughs) there was no, there was no uh, connection to it. And I think that they were opening the door because, A, it was two things. One, pat ourselves in the back, look what we're doing. But also two, like look at the great technology we're developing and that was all part of their PR campaign. But I think there's a negative connotation. Like if you're a filmmaker, it's great because you have this, you have commentaries, you have all that Mm -hmm, stuff that you mm -hmm, can learn mm -hmm. from. But as the general audience goes, like if I sit down with someone and they're like, I hate CG. It's like, no, you just hate bad movies. (laughs) You don't know. know, Like CG is just that's not it's it's just a tool yeah like watch any of fincher's movies and you won't be able to guess what cg in i know man he's insane you just don't like bad movies that that's all it is that's fine and and as an audience member that's all you need to know the fact that people like this is how much it made in the box office and this is how much and fucking rotten tomatoes and the fact that all that stuff it's just killing it so my point is that i'm jealous of the spielberg days where he got to uh, direct Columbo and do stuff on TV and then do the duel and, and do all that stuff and learn on screen. So he's literally there just learning. So it doesn't have to be a fucking perfect movie. And a lot of these movies that we hold to high esteem these days, if they came out modern day at the level of quality that they did, like you watch Die I love fucking Die Hard. I just, why, just watched it this Christmas. Best Christmas movie ever. And what I love about it is that the camera fucking shakes, the dolly moves are all fucking weird. Like they're rushing around doing that stuff. There oh, stunt! Oh, you can see the stunt guy. The stunt guy. Dude. Bruce Willis is stunt guy. You could see him. So it was like that's such an '80s thing. Thing with Lethal Weapon. Um, oh. Same thing with Predator. Same thing with all those kind of that genre of uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Commando. I just you yeah. love it because uh. you're just in it, and yeah. no one gives a shit. No right. one's sitting there going like, "Oh, the camera's shaking," or like, uh, you "That's know, a like, bad green like, screen." Uh, the resolution, like, <laughs> like the rear projection in Lethal Weapon 2 is god awful. But like at the time when I watched it, right. it's fucking cool. Even so, Terminator 2, man. Like I remember watching Terminator 2 and it's like you go back to some of that rear projection. The opening sequence was all rear projection. And you're just yeah. like, you look at it now going, it was yeah. good for the time. I mean, if you can look at some of the CG in that movie, which was state of the art, it, yeah. some of it still holds up. You know what? There was one, and now we're going to geek out for a second. There's one movie that I... That was in the 90s that, mm-hmm. if you watch it right now, holds up almost it perfectly is The Matrix. Ooh. Yeah, The Matrix. Yeah. The Matrix is VFX and what they did yep. does not age. It, they did it so perfectly well. And yeah. because they combined practical with CG and it didn't. Yeah. I'm not talking about Matrix Reloaded or Matrix Re- Revolutions. I'm talking about just The Matrix. The other ones, the other ones don't hold as well. But the first yeah. Matrix in 99, man. Ooh, get chills. Yeah, it, well, that, it comes down to that practical CG element. And this is something that I, I talk about now that we're pushing these movies all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm, a fucking, I'm a practical dude. So if you watch 12 Cam, not, I sent you the full thing for 12 Cam. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. saw the tra- I only saw it on Caesar, though. Oh, you got to watch it. So I can't, can't the wait. Whole, the whole thing, there's no CG. Yeah. And so when you watch it, you there's all this stuff that you go, oh my God, look at the CG. I literally got, 
a microbiologist who's a, a macro photographer, uh, $500. And went into his basement in, yeah. in Amish country, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, I saw. I saw the And the shot all of the effects through microscopes. So all those effects that you think are killer CG, CG. Yeah. are actual science experiments. Yeah, and I know. I saw shot. I saw that documentary. I saw the behind the scenes of it. And I said that the, the, the biologist is like, uh, I've never had a filmmaker call me to want to do this. So I said, <laughs> this sounds pretty cool. This is better than my normal day of just looking through a microscope and picking out pores and shite, you know? So, <laughs> so it's like, but it's a, but you know what the, um, Aronofsky did that with the fountain. Yep. yep. But he did it practically, but it was like with this combination of like chemicals and the way the yep. chemicals were, for, oh, it was so, be, like Dude, you, you couldn't back, do CG. You couldn't do it in CG that way. Dude, you go back, you, I love Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh, I love, oh God, such it's a good movie. so great. And so the, their work with light cues and shadow play in that movie. Oh, and miniatures and miniatures and the way they did oh. perspective. Ah, just, sorry, sorry guys, we're we're geeking out. Just two filmmakers geeking out about <laughs> yeah. about our generation's uh, times of films of, of what like oh that movie. But uh, I mean, even though it is our generations, not to cut you off, even though it is our generations of of stuff, these techniques are still being used today. Yeah. They're just being blended nicely with CG. Yeah. So if you're, like, if you're good, if you're smart. Yeah, and you're just blending those areas because. As a shooter, um, one thing that – this is what I said when I was doing 12 cam. I said, I'm not going to do CG because I don't have the money for it. And if you don't have the money for CG and crappy CG looks like shit. Mm -hmm. But as a shooter, if I have something to film, something crappy filming, I can find accidents. I can find optical accidents and, and a really great things through the lens. So let's do everything practically. And because of that, uh, it just – it starts to build its own smell. It's like I said, the movie smells a certain way. It it's, a to build it's a stank, its, sir. it's a stank, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. You can only get that practically. You can't get that because it, it, when you're in CG land, you have like a lot of people that are on the computer and it's going through all these different brains. And then most of the computer people are just like, well, it's not high enough resolution on the, you know, and so like their focus is different than mm -hmm. when you're on set practically staring at a monitor and going like, wouldn't it be cool if we just turn the camera like this and then put a light into it? Yeah. Okay, great. Let's do that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, I would agree with you 100%. We could talk about this for hours, but yeah. um, we're going to, I'm going to ask you a few questions uh, that ask all of my sure. guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Uh, I would say young filmmaker trying to break into the business. I would say, okay, make stuff that they can see online. So the best thing in the world, I, I was uh, I was told this actually by uh, producers. Um, if you're a short filmmaker, don't expect to get a movie deal from a film festival. Uh, when producers and production companies go to film festivals, they go to look specifically at features. That's why they go. And so if you go to a film festival and you're programmed to short in like a 10 bundle or 15 short bundle or whatever it is, you know, uh, yeah. they're not going to sit through all that shit. They're just not. And so the place that they look at short films is online. And the place that they look at short films is like uh, Vimeo and different. They, they, they hire people and assistants that go through certain blogs and, web, uh, and websites. So if you can make a good piece that is interesting, exciting to watch, promote that piece online, have that piece written about, have that piece become like a, a video of the day or have it be put on someone's website your chances of having it seen are a lot greater. And actually, these days, whether or not you're talking movies or you're talking advertising, I know all creative directors hire off of Instagram right now. 100%. Really? They don't even, they don't even go to your fucking website. Really? They hire off of Instagram. Everybody's hiring off of Instagram. Because the people that are hiring for, for creatives on commercials, they're like mid-20s, low-20s. Mm -hmm. So they're just scrolling through going, oh, I really like this guy's art. How many followers? Oh, cool. All right, great. Let's hire him. Boom. Everything, dude. I was literally doing a location scout in a hotel the other day for a photo shoot. And, and the young creative person at the hotel was bragging how she found all the artists for the place on Instagram. And they paid me. Wow. Good to know. So, and, and I, I want to just, and I, I just want to say one other thing, because you, you brought up film festivals a couple of times and, the, and how you kind of with, with 12 KM, you kind of just skirted the festival circuit and on my last feature i wasted a year of, of yeah. a year chasing the chasing the, the i was chasing the dragon uh not that dragon the other dragon um 
I wasn't chasing that dragon. It's still, it's still chasing, as expensive. It's still, the other dragon is really much more expensive than film festivals, but not that dragon. I was chasing the. Uh, I was chasing Sundance because I shot a movie at Sundance, first feature oh. film ever to be shot at Sundance narrative. So I was like, it's a love letter to Sundance, man. I gotta, I gotta believe this. If there's a shot, this has to be it. Yeah, and it wasn't. And I just said I wasted a year. I could have had this out earlier. And I just now have said to myself, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm just not. Anything I make from now on is going to be either for online distribution, say, and just focus online, man. Because the festivals are great and everything, but I think there's just so many variables with it. And back when festivals were young, yeah, back yeah. when like the '90s, you know, like early '90s, 90s. Yeah, 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 because the internet didn't really exist for that. And then uh, that's where you would go. And then you had producers, uh, uh, producers that turned out to be terrible people, but producers that would go and find, <laughs> they would find these this talent. It, 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 does yeah. that producer's name sound like R.V. Einstein? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as, as, as terrible as that guy is, oh, and God. he's a terrible, terrible, Human terrible being. person. Yeah. Uh, he found all the greats in the 90s. He was there, yeah. man, and he, I mean, he did you know, what he did. Look, you're talking, you're talking Tarantino, you're talking Rodriguez, you're talking Smith, you're talking all of them, Guillermo del Toro for the American stuff. You're talking all that stuff. Yeah, he didn't mimic. Yeah, and you know, it was really just a handful of producers that understood the power that film festivals had, and they exploited that to get great talent. Right. Um, and nowadays it's different. I feel like I'm learning that the film industry is a lot different than it used to be. Film industry now is becoming very corporate. So I feel like a lot of the skills that I've learned through doing commercials, mm -hmm. I'm using on uh, pitches and stuff because it's almost like you're now pitching to Walmart. <laughs> no, in a lot of ways. And you have to build yeah, a brand just, and you're building your yeah. own personal brand yep. as a filmmaker and your website and your Instagram and your Facebook and your Twitter and all the all the stuff yep. you're doing. That's what you need to do to build a career now. Where be before you didn't. Yeah, because that's how people find you. And that's how people are looking at your stuff. Now can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? The book. Huh. That's interesting. The book. There's one book that constantly gets brought up on this broad, on this podcast, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait if you and, and when the second I say it, you'll go, oh yeah, that's the one. <laughs> I was gonna say, is it one of your books? <laughs> no, it's not. I've only written one, and it hasn't come out yet as of this recording. So no. <laughs> yes, it's called uh, Shooting for the Mob. It's changed my life. It's fantastic. <laughs> Available February twenty second on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, when's it, when's it gonna be on Audible? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it, man. I'm working on it. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, all right. So I would say books for me, it's probably comic books. Okay. Because yeah, that's fine for, for me. It's comic books. I think the stuff that really changed my world. I remember when I was younger, um, I was terrible at reading. I'm sure I have some sort of dys dyslexia. There's mm -hmm. some sort of shit in there. Um, and my mother was just concerned that I would never read a book. And so she went out one day, grabbed a handful of comic books and brought them home to me when I was a young kid. And it was like an amazing Spider-Man book. It was really great books, actually, mm -hmm. from the time period. Amazing Spider-Man and the X-Men. Um, and I, I think that first Amazing Spider-Man book was the one that changed everything for me because there was something so cool about opening it and seeing action conveyed in still images mm -hmm. and body posturing and posing and all that mm -hmm, kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I would say, for me, it was probably that Amazing Spider-Man. I forget my number. It was like 470 or something like that. But yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, you were going up there. Yeah, I, was, I have I have almost a whole collection of Amazing Spider Man. I Dude. Love it. Yeah, I love it. I love I love that stuff. The, the McFarlane runs. Oh yeah, and the whole we can get nerdy about image and all all that oh. stuff. Anyway, oh yeah, we could. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> a whole other <laughs> that's podcast. a whole other conversation. Uh, now, uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? The longest lesson, I would say. I would say that – I'm just trying to figure out the right way to phrase this. I would say that um, learning the difference between confidence and cockiness. Okay. I think that was like the thing that took a while. And I think that 
when you're young, when I was young, when you're young as a filmmaker, you're compensating. Because mm-hmm. what the, the thing with our job is that you really can't actually do your job unless you convince everybody to be there. So <laughs> or follow you, you can right yeah yeah so you can you can practice aspects of it, mm-hmm. but like the actual be a director on the day you had to convince a fuckload of people to actually show up and do it. And so when you're younger, you're dealing with that insecurity because you've never done it. Or you haven't done it at the scale that you want to do it. So you're compensating with insecurity with ego. And so you're coming in and you're just sort of like, yeah, fuck yeah, I can kill this. Oh yeah, this is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. This is going to be, this is going to be great. And then you, what you're, you're combining that with your, you're still learning how to take what you have as a vision in your head and get it out of this thing. Mm-hmm. So you're still trying to figure that out. And so what happens with a lot of young filmmakers is you hit this point where your idea isn't coming across. Mm-hmm. And so instead of reevaluating and checking your ego and understanding that you're not communicating it correctly, a lot of people will just smash and try to run over the problem. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, here's what I want. Just fucking do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And I've learned over time that the people that are in that mode are just like, here you go. And they just set something up and they walk away. And you're just like, nah, that's not what I wanted and sort of go through this process. So it took me a while to figure out like, okay, look, you have to be confident, but you can't be egotistical and you have to learn how to make this thing work uh, for this. Fair uh, enough. I think, I think I answered. I think you did. Yeah. I think you did. And uh, the toughest question of them all, three of your favorite films of all time. I would say three all time. Alien. Mm-hmm. I would say <laughs> The Thing. Mm-hmm. I would say Blade Runner. Yeah, fucking Blade Runner, man. Yeah. I'll tell, uh, can I tell you my Blade Runner story real quick? So yes, when I go. get here, I, I watch Blade Runner for the first time. I had not watched it. I'd always like watch parts of it, but I watched it a decade or so ago. And I watched it, and I was watching it with a friend of mine who's a DP, and he's like, did you see that scene when, they, when, when he visited the, the, um, the, po- the, uh, the police station? He's like, uh, do you want to go? Do you want to go there? I'm like, yeah. Can we go there? And of course, we go down to Grand Central, not Grand Central, <laughs> but what is that? The train station here in LA. I forgot the name of it. The big. Yeah. And then you walk in, you look over, and I'm like, oh, oh my god, it's right there! Like that freaked me out. My mind was blown. And then you start going <laughs> to all the locations that they shot around town. And anyone who's watching, listen to this right now, or watching this, please go watch Blade Runner. Just please, oh yeah, please oh, just watch it's... Blade Runner. I mean, I was, I was, just... look, I was actually. I was actually uh, coloring uh, this years ago. One of the uh, he's one of the biggest music video directors in in the world right now, and I was working with him as a colorist back then. Oh, cool! And I was talking to him, and I'm like, "Hey, so you want me to do this little like Blade Runnery here?" And he's like, "Yeah, I don't know what that is." He was like, <laughs> he was like 22, and I'm like, and I stopped, and I'm like, "Are you effing kidding? Are you kidding me? You're a music <laughs> video director. Do you not know Ridley Scott's work? The guy kind of invented." Things. All of it. All like, of it. All him and Tony. Him and Tony, yeah. man. Like they kind of like before Bay, before Fincher, before all those guys. There Dude, was Tony. Tony. Oh, Tony oh, Scott, man. Oh, Tony Scott. I oh, love Tony Scott. God, I and love I, Tony. Oh. And I just watched uh Man on Fire again oh, the other day. God. The movie is so good. And the cool thing, like I said, my guest uh, later this afternoon on my show, Zach Mark, and Zach started as Tony Scott's assistant. Oh, so he must I, have some stories. I, I cannot wait. And it, it, this is like Days of Thunder time. Ooh. Like this is like this is then where I'm like, dude, I need to know like you watch, what it was like. Like you watch Man on Fire, and you're like, oh, that was that was directed by a 25 year old. Like music video director, like it was not. It was he was in his sixties uh, when he did that. Like, because yeah, so Rid- Ridley's first movie he made when he was forty, I think it was forty or forty one. Yeah, Tony was about the same time. Tony made The Hunger. Which yeah, Hunger was, was great. A great fucking. And Duelist movie. was the other one. Yeah, yep. And Duelist was the other one. Those guys were our age. Yeah, that's what really comforts me. That comforts me. So, but, but, yeah, because before it was like, oh, I got to do what Orson Welles did, or I got to do what Spielberg did. He was 27. Or, and then it's like, oh, well, I think Tarantino was like 31 or 32 when he did Reservoir. But now, oh, Ridley and Tony, they were in their 40s when they did that, but they were very accomplished. Sure. <laughs> Much more accomplished sure. than you and I, sir, at the sure. same age. <laughs> sure. 
I mean, they had a huge commercial company, but it was a it was a yeah, different yeah. time. Oh, it's a, it's, yeah. like they were. They, I mean, the you, competition was everything. Everything was changed. They set it up. They set the whole and, damn thing up. I mean, even after them, you look at like propaganda films, and you <sighs> look at David Fincher and all those guys. That was a period of time for music videos. I thought I was going to be a music video director, and when I got into it, we started doing music videos. At the tail end, so I would talk to older directors um, that had been doing it years prior, and I would have budgets on my videos that was their percentage take off of yeah. their oh, videos. Oh, God, yeah, I remember those days. Yeah. And so they, they would say to us, like, how the fuck are you guys going to survive? And as kids, we're, you know, as kids, as younger guys, we're like, we're just going to do it. We're going to get in it. We're going to do it. And it's just going to go up. It's going to happen. And then you hit a point with music videos where you realize people stop buying CDs. People stop putting money into the industry, and the first careers that go are all of our careers. The fucking A and R reps and the promotional people. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I was around when like like Roadrunner Records had like three floors, and they condensed down to like fifteen people. Mm -hmm. it, and so, music videos quickly became a thing of the past, and they still exist now. But now, it. I, Oh no! I mean, five hundred dollars for if you're lucky. I hate to feel like, it's like it's, it's like trust fund kids that have a fucking sweet camera. They're like, "Yeah, I'll do it for free," you know. And they go and they shoot this really cool stuff, and you're like, oh, "There was a career there." There used to be. I would do two or three, four music videos a year, and be good to go. I was talking uh, to uh, Dale Restonini, who did. He credits himself for doing over fifteen hundred music videos, mm -hmm. and that guy, uh, you know, he made so much fucking loot. And it was just a different time. It's like, time. Look, but it looks like, look, we're in that time right now. Instagram, Instagram influencers are making millions of dollars a year. Do you think that train's going to live forever? It no. won't. It won't. No. This is a really YouTube stars. Uh, you know, that kind of, there's a, there's a moment in time we're living in that moment, but that will not be around in 20 or 30 years. It just and won't. Hope, it, it just hopefully people are like, I hope that people are still going to be into this, this format. You mean it, films in general, like films? Yeah, and, I think films and TV, like the, the the demise of cinema, has been you know heralded ever since you know TV, you know, yeah. and then color TV, and then uh, then the, the cable, and then DVDs, and then now streaming. Everyone's like, oh, the movies are going to die. I think we'll they've just been around, uh, they've yeah. been around. They're they're going to be around for a long time until we're all walking in the holodeck. And then even when we're walking in the holodeck, I still think somebody's going to want to sit back. And just have the story told to you. It's all perspective, right? It's point of view. Yeah, so. I think. Um, and then, and then, and uh, where can people find you? Where they can can they see twelve uh, km? I'll put a trailer and I'll put all the all your links in the in the show notes. Sure. The best way to reach me is uh, on Instagram. If you go to at Mike Petchy on Instagram, um, it's a private account, but I accept most people. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go there, and then if you write me a note. You write me a message on Instagram saying that you listen to this show and that you want to see 12 cam. I'll send you a link. How about I'm the, only sending out personal links. How about, how about, how, how about the Punisher? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you and I could have a conversation about where yeah. I could get that private link. Yeah, I would love to yeah, see yeah. that. <laughs> I mean, off yeah. I mean, of course you would never do it. Wink, wink, but you would never ever in a yeah. million years. The movie doesn't exist. I burned everything. You burned the negatives. Uh, the obviously. Movie. Cause I shot it on film. Of so course. I, of course. God, you I shot it on film? Oh, no, God, I didn't. No, I didn't know it. But it's, a, yeah, I did. And I burned every. You shot 35, right? Film. 70. Yeah, I think you shot 70 mil. 70 mil. I burned, the, I burned the building that we shot it in. So none of that exists. None of it exists. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but if you, uh, gotcha. if you follow me at Mike Petcha on Instagram and then uh, check out my podcast, it's called In Love of the Process. Um, we do. If you think I rambled hard on this episode, I do a lot of rambling. <laughs> no, man, it was great stuff, man. Honestly, it was just you know two two uh, old dogs, old salty dogs who've been around a couple a couple blocks uh, talking shop. So it's it was a great episode, and I really you know kind of wanted to spotlight a little bit about uh, proof of concepts and your experiences with them because you're doing them at a very very high level. So I, re I really love your style and what you did. But thank you for Thanks. dropping the knowledge bombs on the on the tribe today, man. I truly appreciate it, brother. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on the show.